Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here and for your patience. Just going to give a 30 more seconds for folks to log on. We're super excited um, that you're joining us for this lunch hour fireside chat. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start us off again. Um, as you all may know, it is Black History Month at UCSF, and we're super excited to welcome um, Jasmine Lamit. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name wrong, Jasmine, um, who's going to be um, having a conversation um, with Clint Jaramillo on um, her book, The Black Mental Health Workbook. Um, and before we start, I wanted just to go ahead and give gratitude and honor um, to the Black History Month 2023 Planning Committee. Um, this committee is comprised of learners and staff who are part of these organizations below that have committed um, to weekly meetings and really take on the leadership in creating these offerings for members of UCSF. So I wanna be able to uplift the Black Caucus, um, Benioff Children's Hospital Oakland Black Caucus, um, Benioff Children's Hospital, um, their DEI department, Black Excellence in STEM, which is a student org in the graduate division, the Student National Medical Association and School of Medicine, and the Student National Dental Association. Okay, so I'm sure that we're all privy to Zoom protocols, but just to make sure that we're starting off um, all on the same page, these are some gentle reminders, just to ensure that everybody can have an enjoyable experience. Um, the first one is being respectful of the chat, and we want to make sure that we're uplifting folks um, and, you know, adding to the chat that's going to expand our curiosity and our wonderings about the topic. Um, just a note that we are going to be having a question and answer segment um, towards the end of the session, um, and that will be your opportunity um, to ask Jasmine um, questions yourself. Um, if you need live captioning, um, that is a an option at the bottom, so you can go ahead and turn that on. And then, yes, we will be recording this session, and it will be shared with you all through the Office of Diversity and Outreach's website and newsletter. Um, so just stay tuned and look back on the website probably within the next two weeks. Okay, so before we start, I just want to ground us in a land acknowledgement um, and just give honor and gratitude to Dr. Tossi Bongiovanni, um, the Native American Health Alliance and the Association of Native American Medical Students at UCSF, um, who worked together with Ohlone representatives to create this land acknowledgement um, for the UCSF Parnassus campus. Um, it's important to also name that um, UCSF is part of the public land grant um, universities, um, and we continue to benefit from the disposition of or disposition of native lands um, that was acquired um, through the Morrell Act of 1862, which actually created the University of California. Um, and we are guests here. Um, and we would like to acknowledge the Ramatu Shaloni people who are the traditional custodians of the land. We pay our respects to the Ramatu Shaloni elders, past, present, and future who call this place, the land that UCSF sits upon their home. We are proud to continue their tradition of coming together and growing as a community. We thank the Ramatushaloni community for their stewardship, and we look forward to strengthening our ties as we continue our relationship of mutual respect and understanding. So a second part of land acknowledgements is really to uh, self-reflect on how you may take action and what to do next. And these resources, again, were carefully and intentionally curated for our community at UCSF to really think about how we can get involved. Um, so, you know, one way is really understanding um, Indigenous history and what are current events or Indigenous efforts that are being led locally, nationally, and globally. Um, and for those of us that might be in a more resourced place, um, there's also opportunities to support land rematriation efforts. Um, and you can do that through contributing to land taxes. Um, so, see some, so these are some options for those folks living in San Francisco. You can pay the Unikin land tax. And those folks that live in the East Bay, particularly um, you know, in Berkeley, Emeryville, Albany, um, but it's also inclusive of Oakland. There's also the Shaumi land tax, um, which is part of the Segoriate land trust. And again, you can familiarize yourself with these resources and how you may want to integrate land acknowledgements into your own um, department or units by visiting um, the diversity.ucsf.edu um, website. 
So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our lovely moderator today, who is the MRC director and L the MRC and LGBT director, director um, Clint Hadamil. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to you, Clint. Thank you, Melissa, and, th and, and thank you to the planning committee for making sure that we continue to um, honor and center the voices of Black folks at UCSF and continuing to partner with us here at ODO and also the Multicultural Resource Center. Um, I have the honor and pleasure of welcoming a friend, a colleague, a fierce mom, and an author uh, to today's fireside chat. John Jasmine Lamide is a licensed social worker, licensed clinical social worker, and the director of mental health services for 20 schools in Los Angeles, and a certified trauma and resilience-focused clinical practitioner. During her free time, she is a clinical supervisor and trainer and creator behind the Social Work Stage Instagram page about mental uh, about school mental health by night. Jasmine received her BA in psychology and Africana studies from Pomona College and her master's degree in social work from the University of Chicago. Since 28, 2008, she has worked with children and adolescents in Chicago and Los Angeles schools and communities of color. She is now a published author of the Black Mental Health Workbook, which was published this year. And we're just so excited that you're doing your book tour. You're stepping here at UCSF. And I'm just happy that you, you get to share your, your experience, your, um, your personality, and everything that you are with us today. So oh, thank, thank you. Clint. Yay, I am so <laughs> honored to be here and, and really excited to, to talk about this with you. <laughs> <laughs> so folks, um, I want to just explain quickly the format of the event. This is a fireside chat conversation. So Jasmine and I will go back and forth with some questions. And then at the end, we'll open it up for some Q&A from the audience. Um, this will look a little different if we were in person. So with Zoom, um, we'll be looking at the chat. Uh, Melissa will be looking at those questions as well. Um, but at the end, we'll, we'll do some of the Q&A. I want to let you all know that Jasmine and I go way back. Actually, I met Jasmine <laughs> at the University of Chicago when we both were graduate students in the School of Social Work. Um, and I clearly remember being in orientation and we were both sitting in a sea of, you know, future social workers and we just made eye to eye. And, you know, we had that look, it's like, when you only see a few brown folk in the, in the audience, then you just made that eye contact and you're like, I see you and I see you. And then we decided to have lunch outside and then we became friends. And now, um, you know, you're a, a, a book author. Look at you. Oh my, God. oh my gosh, I love that. I vividly remember that as well. Yeah, you're always, when you go to these spaces, you're always kind of look, scanning the room for people that like, do you get it? Do you see what I'm seeing? So I was always really happy about that too. <laughs> so let's let's dive in because, you know, we, we have very limited time. Um, so I, I want to start with <laughs> your passion and expertise for breaking mental health stigma and supporting healing within Black communities. Mm -hmm. How did your experience working with youth and families inspire this book? Or how did this book come about? Yeah, yes, okay. So it really, I mean, I never thought or wanted to be an author, I guess, but um, you know, with the pandemic, I, I had a, a baby who's now almost three at like the beginning of the pandemic. And so I had a lot of time to myself. I was very isolated. Um, and I was in a lot of, um, you know, mom chats for black moms and um, also, you know, talking with my friends as everybody was going through stuff. Um, and I, I was seeing a lot of the similar trends of, um, you know, just not really knowing how to access mental health services. Um, I think sometimes as people that are in clinically trained, we just naturally see things and, you know, common sense isn't so common, right? So my friends would be describing things that they were going through, my Black friends, and I'm like, oh, that sounds like depression, or that sounds like anxiety, or maybe that's PTSD, but that's where my brain goes. And so being able to just have these conversations, I started thinking about what would it look like to do kind of a easily accessible, you know, workbook, easily digestible workbook for folks that were just trying to explore explore their mental health, maybe weren't ready to start therapy, but wanted to get a little bit more insights onto who they are, you know, how their Blackness inf influences, impacts, um, and, you know, can either um, uh, 
decrease or increase your mental health, depending on your communities you're in and the supports that you have. Um, and so, yeah, I started writing it in 2020 and starting pulling, you know, activities and things that I've done with parents and caregivers over the years. Um, I primarily have done clinical interventions with kids. Um, but of course, if you're working with kids, you're also working with their adults in their lives. Um, and so I, I started to kind of just pull those things together and um, wanted it to be something that anybody could pick up and learn from, whether you're Black or even if you are um, a clinician who's non-Black, being able to learn a little bit more insights and and really gaining that cultural humility, that cultural competence in working with Black clients. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit about like how folks who are not Black can utilize the workbook. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I want to go back to kind of just talking a little bit about your professional journey and if, if you saw anything um, <clears throat> or any patterns that influence your book. Um, and then we'll dive right into like the two parts of the book. And, you know, there's there's an opening to the book that is very, very exciting for me that I want to kind of get into. But maybe you can just share quickly about your, your professional journey and how that influenced your book. Yeah, so... Um... I have always, you know, and I think a lot of social workers are this person. I've always been the person in the friend group and in my family that is the person people go to, right? Mm -hmm. To like get support or, you know, get idea. You know, I've always been that person. So I knew I wanted to be a psychology major in college. Uh, I knew that was, I didn't know about social work, but I was like, I know I want to do that. So I did that. Um, and then I found, I went to Pomona College. Um, we had an Africana studies major, which I had never heard of growing up where I did. And and I definitely didn't get a lot of learning about the Black community other than what my mom, you know, tried to instill in me. And then, you know, the basic stuff that everybody learns about Rosa Parks and MLK, right? So I wanted to do get more in depth with that, um, which really kicked off me going, deciding to do the social work um, degree. I did a summer research program at the University of Michigan in college in the social work department. And I learned that there were school social workers. I learned that there were all kinds of social workers because mm -hmm. the ones that I encountered um, as a kid, because we, you know, had DCFS or CPS cases throughout my childhood, were not not the social worker I wanted to be. So I learned that there were other types. Um, so I went to University of Chicago because they had a like a school focused uh, mental health school focused clinical social work program. Um, and I worked um, for the two years in that program in the south side of Chicago, um, which compared to Los Angeles is very segregated. So that was a big like eye opener for me, um, you know, as, as you recall, there's like the, mm -hmm. like you can cross the street and it's like, here's the black neighborhood, here's the Latino neighborhood, it's very segregated. Um, so my schools, my internships were all, and my jobs were all in the South LA community, 99.9% .9 black. Um, and, you know, I, I really valued being able to be in a position as a social worker, as a black woman, and having these conversations with, with families, with kids, kind of helping to, you know, question and, and, and put in really discuss like what stigma looked like in the community and you know hey like I'm not like I'm not that kind of social order like you can talk to me so um and that really translated to when I decided to retire from winter and move back to California and <laughs> I was like what am I doing out here for four years um, moved it back to LA. Um, and, you know, even um, Los Angeles, uh, definitely more diverse. My schools, um, you know, are pretty evenly split between um, Latinx and Black um, communities in East and South LA. And so really even being able to help teachers, um, you know, understand like the dynamics between um, Black and Latinx um, students and families, like how they can integrate these practices, um, that it's not a monolith. Like, you know, there are folks that are Afro-Latino or people that are, you know, Latino right. and identify as, you know, so it's like, it's not like so siloed. Um, and so, yeah, I, I really, um, through my work of really trying to, I founded a mental health department for 20 schools and they didn't have one. And so really thinking about how am I going to start integrating these practices when in communities that are like, um, we don't have mental health, like we're not crazy. I'm like, Ugh. so really trying to hear and listen to, you know, what was going on with, for them and their experiences while also trying to kind of shift that narrative and, and reclaim like, Hey, we deserve mental health too. Everybody has it. And, you know, for by us saying we don't like we're missing out on um, of some key aspects to our overall wellness right and and now there's a, a book right like that folks can access and and learn about practices exercises and you know overall wellness for for the black community and then also for folks who uh, may be able to provide additional support for the black community so let's turn to the book the book is divided into two parts 
Black Mental Health Matters and Black the Black Mental Health uh, Toolkit. So let's turn to part one of the book, which links history, the sociology, psychology, and current events to the Black experience in mental health. You are framing and beginning the book with a very powerful statement, Black mental health matters. What does that mean to you? Yeah, well, you know, um, I think we, because of the stigma that has been associated with, um, you know, caring for our mental health or like really equating mental health with mental illness when it's two separate things, right? Mental health is think, something that everybody has and everybody wants to keep and maintain. Mental illness is something, um, you know, that it's we would want to provide treatment for or interventions, right? But everybody has mental health. And so thinking about um, um, us being able to own that our mental health matters too, similar to like the Black Lives Matters movement. Like we wouldn't have to say it if it was already happening. There is a hist um, long history of utilizing uh, psychology, the field of psychiatry as a, um, in a weaponized form against black people going all the way back to, um, to um, when we were enslaved in this country from everything from, you know, design coming up with made up um, clinical diagnoses, um, such as drapetomania, which was essentially if an enslaved person wanted to escape the, their bonds of slavery, that meant that they had this drapetomania. So like, there's nothing wrong with slavery. Like if they want to run away, that means there's something wrong with them, right? So even going way back to then, um, you know, and of course, all of the um, um, experiments and, you know, forced sterilization of Black women, like the gynecology field was founded on, on you know, experiments with it with Black women. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have this long history of utilizing psychology as a tool of oppression, um, you know, being um, all of the founders of the APA, all of them are all like eugenicists, racist. So it's not surprising that this field is it's grounded, it's rooted in racism. Um, and a lot of the even going up to, you know, the 90s of like the super predators, right? Um, schizophrenia, like changing in the 70s, the diagnosis criteria to include the term aggression, um, which is in, in turn has created a um, high number of black males that are identified as having schizophrenia um, because there's that implicit bias that black uh, men are aggressive, right? So there's all of these things that are happening um, within the field of psychology, mental health. Um, and so it, to me, Black Mental Health Matters is really about us reclaiming the right to care for ourselves, to advocate for, you know, more professionals in the field that look like us, to change, you know, we went to University of Chicago, a wonderful, reputable um, institution, and yet I'm try I was trying to, I was writing this, trying to think back to like how many of these conversations were we even having in our classes, right, mm -hmm. you know, we it wasn't happening, right? Thank goodness we we knew our stuff, but like think of all of our colleagues that left that program and didn't get these this really important information and the harm that that can potentially have as they're out here now, 15 years later, um, doing clinic, clinical work with people in, in both of our communities, right? Um, so that to me is just like reclaiming, like we, we have the right to have access to health, ha access to mental health services too. Mm -hmm. uh, and thank you for that, because I, one of the questions that I prepared for you was, um, as we move along the conversation about, you know, what your schools, future providers, future clinicians um, who are going to be caring for um, the Black community, like the next community, and the list goes on, right, um, that they may not be part of that community, right, they may not be part of that um, uh, either uh, political social group, um, mm -hmm. and what is their own um, responsibility to to not only learn but them to to really scrutinize the systemic racism and the histories of this field that continue to um, demonize uh, black folks that has experimented on black folks and uh, just so you, and I mean you know UCSF is a uh, uh, a university that is a graduate school that is uh, training future medical and you know healers of the world and it's important that that there are spaces where we have these conversations with them to, to really start thinking um, strategically, but also internally about implicit bias, unconscious bias, and their own responsibility to changing the world. Mm -hmm. um, which leads me into well, another chapter in the book, you call it racism is stressful as fuck, or is stressful mm -hmm. AF. Um, <laughs> so, well, first of all, let's take a pause, mm -hmm. because even saying that out loud, has my heart pounding. <laughs> um, right. And, 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 right, right. And I'm assuming there's folks, there's folks in, in the chat 
uh, maybe who who that resonates um, I mean, the, the experience of, um, of of black folks and you know in the last couple of years we we in the the media and um, and and you know I'm gonna pause there for a second because um, you know we we continue to be uh, exposed to black pain and and, and, mm. and media right and, and and we continue to. Uh, to to you know on Instagram and social media to um, re-traumatize uh, folks by by looking at videos of, of the violent murders of, of of black men, black women, black trans people. Um, so I just wanted to just to just pause that for a second um, to acknowledge that. But can we talk um, a little bit about how living in, in a racist society has negative impacts on mental black uh, black mental health? Um, and just your work um, that you've been doing to to kind of inform this particular part of the book. Yeah, yeah, you know, racism is stressful AF. You know, I'm um, <laughs> as, as I was thinking about that, you know, I think because the, you know, those in power don't want to acknowledge that racism exists because one, they benefit from it. And two, if they acknowledge it, that means they have to do something to change it, right? And so it's easier to be, to gaslight us or um, there's uh, some, I forget the name of a professor who is calling it race lighting, essentially <laughs> like, you know, like, no, there's no racism. What do you mean? Like all of that. And I, I had so many experiences with that, with microaggressions growing up, didn't know what a microaggression was until much later. And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. that's what I was experiencing, right? You think of like, um, um, I think of it as like water, right? Water in and of itself, it's like um, something that is, uh, it's harmful, it's harmless, right? We drink it, it's like safe for us to drink, but also it's very powerful, like a drop, a little drop of water that like, drops on the same spot over and over again, you know, for centuries or for decades, um, eventually can erode that material, right? So even microaggressions, which like in and of themselves might seem like a small thing to some people, they shouldn't be called microaggressions. It's a macroaggression. Those things like really, I think of some of the things I heard from teachers or from friends when I was growing up, those like they haunt you, they stick with you, right? Um, those can influence um, our internal self-worth and how we feel about ourselves. Um, it can um, obviously um, lower our self-esteem there's a lot of research about, um, you know, one, depression in the Black community um, isn't always recognized because we may not express it in the same way that other communities might, um, you know, like you, if you're depressed, like you're not going to stay in bed, you got to get up and go to work, right? But that doesn't mm -hmm. mean you're not depressed, right? Um, you know, so thinking about um, about that um, and working with kids, uh, there, I remember when I started my career in Chicago, the idea of like a Black child um, dying by suicide was just like unheard of like 15 years ago. And now, you know, over the, there's been a research article that came out really examining um, actually those, the statistics there and um, the black boys ages five to 10 were of the highest amongst mm -hmm. all all um, groups um, for um, attempting or dying by suicide, which is just, you know, a, this silent issue that nobody's talking about, right, because of this narrative that that's not an issue in our community. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of a lot of things that um, obviously can be living in a racial race based um, society um, that can influence our you know, ability to gain opportunities to believe in ourselves, um, the anxiety that we might be experiencing, um, you know, post-traumatic slave syndrome is another like um, theory um, that um, ha has been put forth of like the generational trauma that our community has experienced. So even if you have not personally or can't recognize the traumas that we've experienced as a community in this um, over the centuries, those things are passed down, like biologically, um, through our um, through our ancestors, um, through your parents, and um, can definitely impact the way that you operate and um, and exist in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and and also the lack of research, right? I think whenever we 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 are trying to obtain better better research, one right, but also better informed. Uh, interventions, right? Because of this long history of many research fields, psychology, medicine, mm -hmm. and the list goes on that continue to um, prey on, on the Black community, right? And so there's that gap as well of how yeah, can we yeah. invest in, in future I, researchers who are Black by the Black community, right? 
Yeah. And like not I, what I've, I remember, and you remember this from grad school, evidence-based practice, evidence-based practice. If it's not an EVP, like don't use it. Right. And so you're like, okay, let me stay in this box. So then you look at the research and I'm like, this is not my community. Like, how do I know this is even going to work? Right. But it's this like um, westernized idea of like, if this was not approved by some white researchers at a university, don't use it. Right. So even just evolving this idea of like, rather than evidence-based practice, but practice-based evidence, like I really, just adjusted to, I know that this intervention works because I've used it several times with this. I don't know who researched it or what, but it works and I'm using it, you know, um, even our, like our code of ethics is very much like, don't, you know, share anything personal. Like you need to be really stuffy. Like black folks, that's not the kind of therapist that most black folks want, right? You want to feel like, you know, this person, you can trust them. Um, so even just some of the foundations of our, 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 um, our degrees of, of these practices don't align like culturally with what um, our communities need. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a, a need for um, really, uh, you know, a, a really ex expanding yes. the different types of, of, of research um, and well, valid research, right? Because I think there's this, in academia particularly that if it's not a particular way of doing research and it's not valid, um, right. and I clearly like have um like I'm, I'm thinking of Gloria and Saldua, who was like, we need mm -hmm. more folks to be entering the, the academy to really disrupt these the spaces um, and for us to take ownership of that space. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for adding that. Um, I, I wanna talk a little bit about folks who are, who are in the field, mm -hmm. um, who are clinicians, uh, either working directly with students, particularly in the college setting uh, or in the graduate school setting uh, who are not black, right? And they may uh, have access to your book and they're reading your book. Um, are there any, particular tips that you have um, for folks who um, who may want to um, avoid re-traumatizing um, and continuing the cycle um, that, that they may have learned in graduate school? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I've um, over the years, because I always tell if you're a clinician, you need to, clinicians need therapists too, right? So I've definitely been in and out to process my own like childhood traumas and I remember one therapist that I had who was a, a white um, woman and I'm um, older, like older than me now, maybe I don't know, 50, something like that. But um, she, you know, she was very nice. She was very like skilled as a clinician, but there's like one thing that sticks out to me about her one time was like me sharing, like I had gotten a promotion and she was, um, it was just, I don't know, it felt like she was so astounded at like what I had accomplished, but not in a like, I'm proud of you way, but like, whoa, like, look at you, black girl doing all these things. Like it just totally shifted the vibe. And I, it, I, it didn't come, it was totally implicit bias. Like it wasn't her being like outwardly trying to hurt me, but I was like, hmm. and I was younger than I probably now I'd be like, what do you mean by that? And I was like, you know, it was a dynamic. I was like, okay, I'll accept your praise, white woman. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, so I, I think about um, like clinicians like that. This person was well-intentioned, very skilled, but also like probably didn't think she needed to learn about anything, right? So really taking it upon yourself just because you graduate with that degree doesn't mean the learning stops. Like we, I've learned so much from the time we walked across that stage at, at University of Chicago, right? Like an unlearned things, you know, my own implicit biases about my own community or about other communities as I've um, continued to grow in this field. And so really taking it upon yourself to do the work that needs to be to happen. I think in the intake processes, like um, if I've ever, and it's rare that I see this, but like asking the your clients, like what um, what does culture mean to them? Like how does culture, you know, um, impact um, your mental health? You know, what are like supports? You know, things like that. So it's like it's already starting the conversation early on. Um, I also think it's really important to acknowledge um, the like racial difference or even a gender difference. Um, you know, just like just acknowledging it, putting it out there because it tells me that okay, you see that we're not the same, and like that means that you know there. Are things you're going to help me with and there's things that you're not going to understand like I need you to know that and that really helps I know for me if I'm working with um, a clinician who's not doesn't look like me um, which there are not a lot of black clinicians out there so that's it's, it can be very hard to find um, and so I would I would say that I would say you know one thing is making sure that you are not putting it on other people to teach you. I know there are people that want to teach and like, you know, have the energy for that. Sometimes I feel that way. Other time, I'm like, I don't have time to teach you stuff. Figure it out on your own, right? Like we shouldn't also have to like 
teach other people how to support us. Like you need to learn, do that work on your own. Um, so yeah, I think the, the way when I was thinking about the book, um, it can be, really be something that, um, you know, if you haven't worked with the, this community, um, obviously we're not a monolith, but it just gives you stuff to think about, really thinks, gives you things or activities that you could do with somebody who maybe is presenting um, with race-based um, stress or race-based trauma, like thinking about how their identity um, has formulated over time, like what are the messages that they've received, um, you know, from childhood to like now adulthood, and really like spending time doing that identity work. Um, and, it, you know, you don't have to be the same race as somebody in order to work through that with them. Because um, it might also be, I know for me, um, I've, I've had imposter syndrome as somebody who's biracial um, in different spaces as a, you know, um, biracial half Black person, um, but I've always identified as Black. And so even like working with a clinician that's Black for some people, if they have had that experience, that might be intimidating. Like, oh my gosh, am I Black enough? Am I saying the right thing? So, you know, it's really finding what works for you and, um, you know, making sure that you are doing that work and, and finding those spaces to learn more as needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I feel like you started. You mentioned like cultural humility and like the own, the own journey for our own clinicians um, within our counseling services departments, and um, and and also there's a call for the institution, right? That you need to hire black therapists, you need to hire black counselors, um, and also a call for the departments who are doing the hiring that we need folks whose experience are reflected in the staff. Right in the faculty and the students. So we need to hire more black faculty. We need to hire more black psychologists, social workers, mental health professionals that are going to be. Um, uh, and I'm not saying it's just because th that they're black that they're going to be just experiencing in the black experience. But I think it is important to also acknowledge that folks need to see the students represented in the staffing and the services that we're providing. Um, so one with one is a call for all clinicians to be trained um, and, and lean into cultural humility and, and, and commit to their personal journeys to change, to, to learn, and also a commitment to hiring more folks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, black, and I would even say like well. for ourselves, you know, cause I, even if you are, um, you know, as I've hired like social workers when I became director who are black and or Lat Latinx and working with kids that look like them, your experience still might be very different than mm -hmm. your client. Right. And so we don't also don't want to make the assumption that like we look the same. We, you know, I understand what you're going through. Right. Because it, it that may not be the case. So I think always coming in with that humility of like, you know, you and you are the expert of you. And I may have some connections, but I'm not going to presume that I that I do know. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. So part two of the book is the toolkit portion. Um, and could you tell me a little bit about the process of creating and designing the exercises and the practices that you've mentioned in this section? It's, it's probably the, the bigger portion of the book that has uh, most of the chapters. I, I want to just, if you can talk through about what that looked like for you in, in creating the, those better practices. Yeah, I mean, so as I was thinking about, you know, the workbook, is, you know, it's a book, but it's not a book book, right? So I didn't want it to be like so word heavy. I wanted people to get right in there, get a little, some knowledge and then start really doing reflection and processing, like having that space to do that. Um, so I was really thinking about over my time and then, you know, did some research to back it up. Like what are the common like mental health concerns that I've seen um, in Chicago and Los Angeles within the black community? Um, and the ones that are constantly coming up are anxiety, depression um, and trauma, I would say like are the, the main ones that I've dealt with. Um, I thought about doing substance use. Like, I feel like that could be a whole nother book. So I'm going to mm -hmm. just make that for later. Um, but, you know, I, I really wanted to focus in on those things because, you know, I have some screeners in there too, for folks that I kind of rewarded a little bit other than like the, um, the standardized assessments that are very clinically jargony um, for people to like really start reflecting on, you know, if, have I lost interest in doing something that I used to do? Have I been isolating myself? Um, is it really difficult to get up in the morning? more so than usual, like things that can, you know, scream depression, but maybe you wouldn't think that those are um, symptoms of depression. Same with anxiety. Um, there's a high, high percentage of anxiety within um, Black women. There's a lot of pressures on Black women to be the strong ones, to be the, you know, the, the glue that holds the community together because of our history of enslavement. And we had to do that. And it's still perpetuated today to be this super, super Black woman, right? No space for anything, but you're constantly worried about that. And that is anxiety, mm -hmm. right? 
And so um, really wanting to be able to help name some of the things that the folks might be experiencing. I think there's a lot of power um, in being able to say like, I have depression or I have anxiety versus like, oh, I'm just worried and I can't get myself out of this or it's a stress, right? So being able to really um, have a label for that, I think can be really healing for folks and, and starting that journey of healing. Um, and with the, the activities, um, I do, I've had to do so many workshops and things over the years. And I love like um, doing things like that with parents, especially, and even with teachers I've done. Um, and so I really wanted things that um, one could be like reflections. So there's a lot of like prompts and journal prompts that you can do in there. Um, like I mentioned, there's screeners so that you can, you know, if you get a certain score, like that might be, you can see hmm, that might be like, put the book aside, like go get some therapy, like here are some resources or like, here, you can do some more exploration. Um, and then even some tools that you can um, implement in your practice outside of the book, right? So like really easy, like grounding activities or meditation activities or, you know, affirmation activities that you can do throughout the day. Um, I also really tried to connect back to like what has been self-care um, in our community over the, the generations and our like, so what are things like music, food, um, you know, if you are, if you love go to church, like that might be a community for you. Um, and so really thinking about how you can integrate some of those practices um, into, um, you know, your overall wellness. Yeah, well, you, you, that's a perfect segue into I want to close the fire chat with self-love and self-care. And you make a difference between self-love and self-care. So share with us what's the difference between those two and then any tips on how to integrate those into life. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I think the way that I, I thought about it is um, self-care is self-love in action, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, loving yourself is about how you feel internally, like, you know, the thoughts, we all have a like running monologue in our head and it might be a really positive one. It might be just like narrating your day or it might be negative, like, oh, Jasmine, you're late again. How could you do that? Or, oh, you're a terrible mom or whatever it is that mm -hmm. you might be feeling that day. <laughs> Um, you know, we have these, um, that, that self-talk that's in our head and we listen to that voice more than any other voice, right? So you think, you know, thinking about like cognitive behavioral therapy, like our thoughts influence our feelings, which influence our actions, right? So if we can shift that, um, those thoughts in our head into being more positive, um, and then self-care and action with self-love is like, how am I also like, what actions am I taking to show my self-love, right? Um, you know, I think think about self-care um, that has been co-opted like it, like many other things for, by Western civilization, um, as it, as many of our things are. But self care is actually really grounded um, in the civil rights movement. Um, you know, Audre Lorde, um, one of the OG feminists, lesbian black ladies. Um, uh -huh. Say it. <laughs> she, has that, she has that quote that's always on Instagram when people are like, it's Black History Month. They're like, you know, self-care is not um, self-indulgence, right? And it's like, but the second part is it's an act of political um, warfare, which Fair. is so powerful. But of course, that's left off. Why does it need to be an act of political warfare? Well, because fighting this fight and dealing with, with race-based stress and racist systems is stressful as that, right? Like I mentioned. And so we need to be doing things actively to continue to fill up our cups so that we can continue to move forward, right? To have that resilience. We shouldn't have to have resilience, but resilience is one of the biggest combaters of like negative physical symptoms. Um, and so, you know, the ways that um, I, I have a self-care plan in there there, just as an example, mm -hmm. I find I'm more likely to do something if I write it down than like saying it. So like, I like having a, it's almost like an accountability measure. So thinking about, you know, self-care is not just bubble baths, which are nice, um, or massages, which are expensive. It's really anything. It could be free. You know, maybe it's like having a conversation with a friend that you haven't had in a long time. Uh, maybe it's taking a walk around the block or like for me, I do like little car parties before I go home because sometimes I need a little decompressing before I have to turn the mom brain on. So I'll like, you know, blast some Beyonce or I don't know, whatever I'm feeling that day, you know, just in that moment for myself can be really, really helpful. Um, so I think sometimes self-care can feel like I don't have time for that, but self-care can be a one minute activity. It can be a, a weekend activity. It really is whatever it means to you. That's going to make you feel better in the long term. Right. Yeah. I thank you for saying self-care is self-love in, in action. I think I'm going to, I'm going to put that somewhere in my office and then like remind myself that oh, we that. need, we need, we need to stop 
I, I, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna frame the next statement saying, you know, um, my staff, folks at UCSF, uh, who are black, who are Latinx, who are queer, right? We continue to be, um, you know, uh, tapped by the institution uh, to care for our community. And so sometimes we need someone to care for us, right? And um, I think it's important for us to to really start thinking about um, what does self care look like in the workplace, um, especially if you are a healer. Um, so I'm, I'm just I'm thinking about um, you know all the black women who are who are um, deans of diversity, the black women who are the directors of mental health services. You're included, right? Um, and and how does the institution has a responsibility to allow for self care to be um, either mm -hmm. compensated, to be centered, to be a practice. Um, that is legitimate, mm -hmm. um, and the supervisors are going to um, to approve. Um, so something, I mean, a little more radical because everyone. I feel like whenever we have this conversation, this conversation is about, oh yeah, self care. Oh yeah, do that. Like yeah, we're Eat all about self care. Right? Yeah. But, <laughs> but what does that even mean? What does self care in practice mean within exactly. a higher education system? And if like you, and this is. A perfect example in schools like it's been rough in schools since the pandemic it's always but you know, it's been really rough and like all these schools are like self-care teachers do your self-care but they're what are the policies that are are there that are actually allowing for self-care like do you have a manager that's like questioning you taking a mental health day or mm -hmm. like you know not asking you like I've noticed you've been sick a lot lately hmm, I wonder if you're feeling really stressed like what kind of trainings are they getting to make sure that we're not just saying the thing but actually putting things in place so that we can access that time time for ourselves and, and keep going because yeah. we need we're not you know if you think about like a car like you have to get mileage checks and you got to fill up the oil I'm terrible at car metaphors but we got to do stuff along yeah. the way so the car doesn't break down we also we're more we have a lot more um than a car then we need to make sure that we're have those spaces to be able to take care of ourselves mm -hmm. yeah yeah and 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 you know what are what are some of the some of the other practices, right? Find your people within the institution, the people that are gonna uh, stand with you um, or walk along with you or, or be in solidarity with you um, as you 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 continue to do the work that you do, the, the folks people that are that gonna be able to- that across the room like, like we did when we met. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Right, right. Um, any, closing, any closing remarks that you may have about your book and- um, huh. How, how folks can can utilize it, um, buy it. I know that we are providing copies uh, for our UCSF staff and uh, and learners, but any closing remarks that you may want to say about just your book in general? Well, I want to say one, happy Black History Month. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate being here. Um, you know, for um, those of you that are on, just, you know, remembering like this is a stepping stone to, to Black history is throughout the year, right? And so, you know, thinking about um, how you can continue to um, amplify and, and learn and unlearn things um, to a better your understanding of um, Black mental health. Um, also, July is BIPOC Mental Health Month. So like starting to think about like how to, um, you know, what types of things and things you want to put in practice for your, um, your BIPOC clients or um, folks that you're working with. Um, and then I guess the, the last thing that I will say is um, you, um, I do a lot of like presentations and I've done like work, um, done you know, things with um, black organizations at colleges, um, with or, um, workplace organizations to kind of go through some of these things as well. Um, so, you know, feel free to, to reach out. I know that they'll be providing my um, contact information, but I'm happy to, um, to discuss um, any of the, those topics as well. Thank you so much. I know that we have about 10 minutes. So I am going to ask um, the audience if they have any questions. Uh, this is your time to um, ask any questions, you know, to Jasmine directly. You can turn on your camera or you can put it on the chat. Mm -hmm. Yes, any question is welcome, especially with those of you, your students. So if you have questions about the field or I love talking to grad students. I have a question. 
Um, do you find that you ever get any pushback for um, just the stigma surrounding mental health? And I believe they said in the beginning that you were that you work in school. Sorry, I was doing something. <laughs> but um, I just find I think things are shifting in a good way. A couple of years ago, my mom didn't know how to like label me with stress anxiety. It was just kind of like, why are you depressed? And as of now with my sister and, you know, it's just kind of like, okay, you know, she's in all the therapy, she's on medication, it's things are different. And now she's able to recognize it in me, which when I was a kid, you know, I needed that and it, she didn't know what to call it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I, I have definitely seen a shift for the positive in terms of folks, um, you know, even like being able to utilize those terms, right? Like depression. I mean, like the kids, I work with K through eighth grade currently, and like they know, like, oh, I got anxiety, I got depression. I'm like, okay, like it's like the stigma is like, especially with the younger generation, is um is lessening. Um, I still, you know, I, I think about um, there are times where, um, you know, we, I have a, a student um, who, you know, has some pretty significant clinical needs. Um, a lot oftentimes might be rooted in trauma. Trauma in adolescence can look like ADHD. Can, there can be aggression, right? And so aggression, um, which is like their fight, fight or flight response, right? Feeling that stress and feeling like I need to get out of here. I need to protect myself. Um, and so I think, you know, if a parent, a caregiver is getting all of these calls every day from the school, um, one, they're already probably feeling like this school does not care about my child because you only are calling me when you have some issue with my kid, right? So you're already setting the tone of like, I don't trust you. You don't love my kid like I do, right? So one of the things that I've been able to do is really in my schools is having like our five to one ratio. Like you should not be calling a parent for the first time about something bad. Like make sure that you're having five positive interactions before you have one negative so that you're like, think of it as putting deposits in the bank, right? I'm putting deposits, if I need to make a withdrawal, we're not going in the red, right? So really building those relationships so that the families feel like, okay, like you're giving me some um, some cri critical feedback about my child, but I believe that you're doing it out of love because you've shown me that already. Um, you know, we we have now in my schools, two social workers in every school, um, which is, and I have 24 schools, um, which I've really fought for over the years. When I started, um, we had seven schools and two social workers. So it was us just, there was not a lot we could do. We were just but putting fires out um, and being able to just be more a part of the school so that the families are seeing us every day when we're welcoming kids in, like really helps um, alleviate some of that, that stigma as well. Um, and really looking at families like, you know, I have this degree or this whatever, but you're the expert of your child. Like I am here to support you and like how we can help your child and help you. This is, I would say the second most stressful thing is being a parent. <laughs> it's really stressful. So um, yeah, I definitely am still seeing it, but I am seeing a lot more families wanting to get services for themselves, um, being open to things like meditation, which is another thing that's been co-opted by the Western civilization, but comes from BIPOC communities, right? So that's ours too. And like being able to really change the, some of those narratives of these practices and how they help us. Mm -hmm. um, I, if I may add, right, the, 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 <laughs> the influence of technology, right? And um, Instagram and, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a lot more, um, you know, I don't want to say popular people, but, uh, you know, there, yes. there are, are TikTok, celebs right? that they, are like, I have, this, I have that, mm -hmm. Right, yeah. and TikTokers, which I'm not on TikTok, but, you know, the, the younger generation um, are growing up in a very different world. Um, they they are exposed to different types of information that we weren't, and then our parents weren't, and then our grandparents weren't, right? Yeah. So um, it is a, a very want to different- connect with each other easier. Like I think about, you know, when I, well, we didn't have that when I was in middle school, like even if you can't find folks at your school, you can find communities of folks that understand, even if they're not in the same space, like that also can be really validating and affirming mm -hmm. too. Right. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions from the audience? 
the causes of young black male suicide. Um, they, so the, the major study that came out, um, and I can send to Clint that way if you want to send it out, um, was really looking at like a longitudinal study. It wasn't like diving into the causes, um, but some of the um, causes, there's a connection between like the school to prison pipeline. So kids, um, you know, having that implicit bias about um, black boys, you know, they are oftentimes two kids, one a black boy, one not, do the same exact thing that's wrong at a school and one might get suspended and the other like it's the parent conversation right so even just like the setting that tone early on um feeling that isolation feeling um you know that black black men have this you know to this day adults that they are not allowed to cry you have to be tough you have to be strong so there's not that space to really process what's going on for you internally with, outside of yourself and so when that happens you are getting in this in this narrative of like you know i there must be something wrong with me if i'm feeling this way like maybe i should be here. Um, and so I have really appreciated a lot of, um, you know, I use this a lot in my, my therapy with kids, like I try to be cool, stay cool with the youngins, using a lot of the lyrics that I'm hearing coming out in the younger generations, or even with Kendrick Lamar's recent albums, a lot about therapy. I was like, yes, tell them, right? So being able to like see other folks talking about like their own um, suicidal ideation or their own um, experiences and normalizing that, hey, it's okay to ask for help, um, I think has been a big shift as well. Uh, right. Read book or some guide and find therapists who are friendly toward. Yes, so there is um, in my book, um, and I'm happy to share those resources as well. There are several and um, several databases where people like myself, who's licensed, could um, have a profile, and that way you can find folks um, that are BIPOC um, or also um, queer um, affirming or queer um, identifying um, um, therapists as well. So there are a few of those that are really helpful. I can share with. Yeah, I feel like we all need like a like a special queer. I think of like a bat signal, right? It's like you, yes. you can recognize a bat signal, but we need something that is for like yes. finding your queer Black, Latinx, yes. Native yes. American therapist. Like we need something that <laughs> that is online um, yeah. where we can find. <laughs> Folks. It's so important because yeah, you don't want to waste your time in, in a in a session, session, session with a therapist and find out like, whoa, you made a comment that, you know, or if I'm like talking about like, I don't know, I'm married to a man, right? I'm bisexual. And if I drop that somewhere and the therapist is like, oh, mm -hmm. like then I'm gonna want to end that right away, you know. Mm -hmm. So being able to have like that space, but also to know that as a client you own that space. Like you can go in there and interview that therapist. I have questions in the book of like things to ask your therapist. You know, they usually give a 15 minute free consult. Use that as I am interviewing you for the position of my therapist. Here are my questions. <laughs> and I will right. let you know if I decide to go with you, you know, so having that power back. <laughs> right. It's a two way street when it comes to finding your therapist, right? And, and Sometimes you may go on a lot of interviews to find that person that is going to be um, a good match for you to do the the journey that you're going to be yeah. embarking with 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 that particular social worker, counselor, psychologist, therapist, however we want to uh, label that person. Um, and it's yeah. Therapy. Well, <laughs> right. <laughs> well, Jasmine, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I am just always so great, grateful to just follow you, follow your stories on Instagram and, and call you a great friend and a colleague. I will share the information um, of your book with our participants. We have purchased some books. So folks, um, uh, for those who are registered and came to the, I see that some folks have already purchased a book. But we are going to be giving, we're going to be giving out extra books. So um, if you have members in the community, um, we are going to be purchasing some extra copies for, for UCSF students, um, faculty, and staff. So please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, Melissa and I uh, will be submitting an order for, for folks to, to get the book. Um, again, Jasmine, thank you so much for, for your expertise and your honesty. Uh, and Melissa, thank you again. And folks who were in the, in the planning committee for making this event happen. Have a well, great you, rest uh, of your day. That you guys can follow me on Instagram, Social Work Sage. Um, I post a lot of, about this topic and other topics. So I hope to, to see you there too. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. Have a great rest Bye. of your Thursday. Thank you.